Exodus chapter 28. Found your place there? Amen. All right, Ezekiel chapter 28. That'll be the first place we read from. All these are tied together about the same thing that we're going to try to preach on. The title of my message today is Three Things the Devil Can't Do. Three Things the Devil Can't Do. And I'm glad that he can't. And I think you will be too when you see him. Found your two places. Amen. Now turn to Genesis 49. That'll be the last place we look at. If you got three fingers, put them in three places. Boy, I wish I had time. I mean, I really do. I wish I had time to read all of Ezekiel 28. I love that chapter. I'm going to tell you why. It's one of the chapters in the Bible that the devil finds out that God is going to give him down the road. He rakes him up one side and down the other in this chapter. Now, I know verse 2 says that he's to address the prince of Tyre. That's the devil. That's a word for the devil. And uh, you can't read this chapter without coming to the conclusion that the devil uh, had access to everything that God gave when he built this old world. He had access to the Garden of Eden. I don't know where he ever got to talk to Adam and Eve or not. I doubt it. He may have. But in his original state, he was a glorious being. As a matter of fact, the Bible says and God says in this chapter, that there wasn't none to compare with the beauty of the fellow called Lucifer or the devil. That was in the original beginning when God created him. He had access to everything. Boy, I, I like this. He had access to every precious stone that was laying around in the Garden of Eden. How would you have liked to live in a place to where you could just go out and pick up a diamond? or pick up a topaz, or pick up any other kind of precious stone. They had, he had that privilege. I'm going to read it to you down in verse 13 of Ezekiel chapter 28. I wish I had time to preach this whole chapter, but I don't. In verse 13, the Lord said to the devil, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God, every precious stone was thy covering. Now read the stones, number them, if you would please, as I read them. The sardis, one, topaz, diamond, burl, ox, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, and I know it says gold, and that would make ten, but only nine precious stones. You see, those precious stones were set in sockets of gold on the breastplate of the high priest and on the breastplate of the devil. You know, the devil had a breastplate just like Aaron did. But he only had nine stones set in silver. We're going to read over in Exodus chapter 28 where God gave all the specific directions to the robe of the high priest. And Aaron was the first high priest appointed under Moses. Now Aaron had brothers that helped him, but his brothers was clothed in white linen. Only the high priest had that special robe. 
And the Lord said that there will be three rows uh, or four rows of three precious stones embedded in gold on that breastplate. Only the high priest had that. That's the reason I said the other day that I believe the devil was worship leader when he was in heaven. I get that because the devil and Aaron were the only ones that had the breastplate and the only ones that had the stones in the breastplate and they were the leaders of worship and singing. Now the devil's job was to give praise and honor to the Lord God day and night. And I believe after a while, according to what God said, after a while, pride began to slip into the devil's heart and he said, I'm giving all this praise. Some of it ought to come to me. So he said, I'm going to set myself up as a God. Well, you know that didn't work. There's only one God, never will be but one God. And that's the Lord our God that we worship. That's the one we're sitting here worshiping today. So, the devil comes up short. He has nine stones in his breastplate. And Aaron has 12 stones in his breastplate. And those 12 stones represent the 12 tribes of Israel. All right, you got that? So why, if he had access to all the stones that he needed, why did the devil only get nine? Well, you're going to have to go to Genesis chapter 49 to find out. I've skipped one, but I meant to skip it. Genesis chapter 49. Jacob is dying. Jacob is calling his 12 sons together. 12 stones together. And he's going to tell them from each of those stones that they wear what their life is going to be like from then on after he's gone. As a matter of fact, he starts with Reuben in verse 3. We and I have time to read them all. But Reuben, Reuben was his firstborn. But in verse 4, he said, You are as unstable as water. Now, what's that mean? That means he shaped himself to whatever came along. You put water in a glass, turn it sideways, and what does the water do? You turn it left, what does the water do? Turn it upside down, what does the water do? You see, Reuben was like water. He could not be counted on. He could not be depended on. We'd call him wishy-washy, wouldn't we? All right, so he speaks to Reuben. Now in verse five, he speaks about Simeon and Levi, but he calls them instance of cruel, instruments of cruelty are in their life. And they're gonna have all kinds of trouble. Down in verse eight, he speaks to Judah and tells him he's gonna have a lot of enemies but he's going to come out victorious. But he says Judah in verse 9 is a lion's whelp. He's going to have all kinds of trouble. The scepter's not going to depart in verse 10 from Judah. So it's not Judah. Judah has a stone. Verse 13, y'all following? Zebulun shall dwell in a haven of the sea, He shall be a haven of ships and his border after Sidon. That's not a stone the devil has. Ishkar is a strong ass couching down 
between two burdens. And he saw that rest was good and the land that it was pleasant and he bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant under tribute. That's a stone that the devil don't have. You say, well, preacher, I don't know what you're getting out of that. Look at verse 6 to verse 14. He's a strong ass or donkey that's under a real burden. One of the things that the devil can't do is help lift your burden. He never will be able to because he don't have that stone. And there's not a person in this building nor a Christian that's living that don't carry some kind of burden. And sometimes those burdens get real heavy and they get real hot and they get you way down. But you can't look to the devil to help lift your burden because he never will. The only thing he does is put more burden on top of more burden on top of more burden until people can't get out at all, they think. But I'm glad, thank God, there's one who is watching and one who is caring and one who is loving that can lift the burdens that come on the hearts and lives of a child of God. And his name is Jesus Christ. He is the burden bearer. Come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for my burden is, is light and my load that he gives you is light. Oh, we'll have to carry burdens along in our life. But thank God we got somebody to yoke up with and somebody that will help carry those burdens. Amen. In Bible times, they used a lot of oxen to plow with and to work with. They'd yoke them up with a wooden yoke. Now as long as each oxen did their job, everything went smooth. But if one oxen kind of balked and didn't pull his part of the load, it put a whole lot more load on the other oxen. And the owner of the oxen had to see, and it was his job to see that both oxen pull their load. Well, I'm glad I got a boss that looks over us, that makes us pull our equal share. If somebody in the church is not pulling their load, then God has a right to step up and say, listen, use what strength you've got and pull your part of the load. Amen. You know what's so wonderful? It's when the whole church pulls together and shoulders the load. Amen. Amen. I'm feeling pretty good this morning. So the devil can't lift your load, but it even gets better than that. He calls out Dan about being a judge, but he also says in verse 17, he's a serpent, by the way. Now the devil don't want you to know he's a serpent, but he is, so that's not him. Gad, a troop shall overcome him, and uh, the devil don't want to be overcome. But look at verse 20. Out of Asher, this is a stone the devil don't have. Out of Asher, his bread shall be fat. He shall yield royal dainties. Now, I didn't know what that meant. What is a royal dainty? Anybody have any idea? Now, I know what a cinnamon bun is at breakfast. That's a dainty, ain't it? Huh? I know what one of them chocolate rolls is about lunchtime. That's a dainty, right? Y'all know what dainties are? Huh? Hey, y'all know what dainties are? Well, this kind of blew my mind. And I didn't know, so I had to go to the Hebrew and Greek dictionary and I found out. 
that this boy had a stone that the devil didn't have that he could bring forth royal. Now that belongs in the king's palace. Royal is high blood. Royal is above the average citizen. This is a man of authority and a man of power and he has the right to bring forth royal dainties. So I looked it up and this is a royal dainty that he could bring forth. Joy. Peace. Happiness. Contentment. Don't you agree that that's a royal dainty? That's better than a cracker peanut butter almost. <laughs> Amen. Sitting down with a good Pepsi or Dr. Pepper. No, no, no Pepsi, Dr. Pepper's. Root beer. Royal dainties. Those are things that ought to be possessed in every heart of a child of God. But the devil can't give it. He might give a moment of happiness. He might give a moment of laughter because the Bible says that there is joy in sin for a season. And when that season has ended, the joy is gone in sin and the happiness is gone in sin and all you got is more burdens and more problems and more anxieties with that kind of sin in your life. But along comes somebody that's got a stone in his breast that represents the royal dainties that only he is able to give. And God is behind it all. He knew what he was doing when he put that stone in Aaron's breast. He knew what he was doing when he wouldn't let the devil have that stone. I say hallelujah. The devil don't give joy. Now listen. You see it on TV, pouring that beer into that glass, the, the foam overflow, looks good, looks good, don't it? I mean, they spend, it don't look good to people who's been there, but they spend millions of dollars on those advertisements. Pour in the wine. Nothing wrong with a little bit of wine. And then comes the liquor. I got a message I'm preaching tonight and you need to hear it. But here comes the liquor. Listen, we are drowning in that stuff in this country of ours. That's what the devil puts on people. I've come to the conclusion that in Washington... We are supporting a bunch of drunks. More liquor flows in that place than any place in the world. They can't have a get together without liquor or without wine or without some beer. And our tax dollars are raising a bunch of drunks that ain't doing nothing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But the devil can't give royal dainties. But listen to this. Angels, all of them, were created without blood. No blood in their bodies. Oh, by the way, since there are no blood in their bodies, they can't reproduce. Because it takes blood to reproduce. There never will be more demons than what they are right now. Because they can't reproduce. There'll never be another devil because he can't reproduce. Hallelujah. But guess what? All that changed, this royal dandy. All that changed when God stepped out of heaven and was born of a virgin and laid in that manger and arose from that manger and went to the cross and gave all of his blood on an old rugged cross, why did he do that? 
so he could reproduce. Amen. It took blood to reproduce. And that rich royal blood, saving blood, powerful blood, sinless blood that was in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ that he shed on Calvary reproduced you and reproduced me. We sit here today by the grace of God, saved by the grace of God. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm a feeling it. I'm telling you what's the truth. I'm glad that the Lord's blood could reproduce. If it couldn't, you and I would yet be in our sins and we'd be doomed. But thank God for the saving blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that produces a child of God. The devil don't have that role, Danny. But let me go on. I think we got two of them, don't we? Well, there's another one. Verse 14, the Bible says, Ishkar is a strong ass couch down between two burdens. I've already got that one. But now look down at verse 22. Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a whale whose branches run over the wall. The archers have solely grieved him, shot at him, and hated him. But his bow abode abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel, even by God of thy father who shall help thee, by the Almighty, who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep which lieth under, and blessings of the breast, and blessings of the womb. And it goes on to talk about more blessings. He has a stone, Joseph does, that the devil don't have. The devil don't have the stone of victory. He has the stone of defeat, but he don't have the stone of victory. If you'll go back when you get home, and I hope you will, and read Ezekiel chapter 28, God tells a devil his beginning, brags on him a little bit about his beauty, brags on him about what he's doing now, and then he gives him his end. He said, your end, you're going to go down to the pit. You're going to stay in that pit where all these ungodly people are at, that have died in sin. In other words, he tells the devil, hell is your home. That means one of the stones that the devil didn't have was the stone of victory. Now you think about that for a moment. We sing victory in Jesus around here a whole lot, and I'm glad there is victory in Jesus because there's sure no victory in the devil. Amen. Never, never, has there been one unsaved person that stood up and said, the devil has given me victory. And you're not going to hear that. But thank God I hear people stand up and say, I got victory over this. I got victory over the drink. I got victory over the drug. I got victory over my attitude. I got victory over everything because the Lord gives victory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I like victory. I don't like defeat. I don't like to get down in the dumps. But we do sometimes. But I'm glad that whatever God sends our way, he's already made a way for us to get out of it. Hallelujah. Y'all need to help me preach. Victory. Victory in Jesus. I got a preacher friend. That if you pull up to his house, over his garage is a great big banner. And that banner says, victory in Jesus. It's not only in his garage. We got victory right here in our church. You got victory over sin, didn't you? You got victory over some of your problems. One of these days, you're not going to have to fight for victory anymore. It's just going to come automatically and you'll have victory forever. Hallelujah. 
That's three things the devil can't do for you. He can't lift your burden. He can't give you anything that you need to keep going on. He can't. I wish I had to. I wish I could just go ahead and preach that message tonight, but I can't. You'll have to come back. Don't you hate continued stuff? I get to watching a western and right in the middle of it to be continued. I hate that. But anyhow, anyhow, you'll see something tonight, I think, that you've never, probably never seen before. And it's all in one book, the book of Ephesians. So what the devil can't give you, thank God, God provided that the high, through the high priest, the worship leader, that you get everything that God has. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. I'm not going to worry about what the devil can't give. I'm going to be concerned about what God can give. Amen. That's what I want in my life and in my heart. Let's stand across the building.